title. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> it is a long title. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of WBC for the great honor to be able to present this research to you. I want to thank all of you, uh, you diehards who have stayed through the end of the conference uh, for attending. I also want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors in this study, in particular Dr. David Bechtel from the Agri Research Center. Dr. Bechtel has been a longtime mentor of mine. He was the contract uh, researcher who actually conducted this study. Now, bacterial culture uh, and, and antimicrobial susceptibility testing is commonly used uh, as diagnostic tests to help us determine what bacterial pathogens are present in bovine respiratory disease and also helps us to select what antimicrobial agents to use in the treatment of that disease. U.S. cattle veterinarians often uh, don't, have, don't use any diagnostics at all as they decide what antimicrobial to use for respiratory disease, but when they do use a diagnostic, they often use just culture and susceptibility testing. The objective of this study bit unusual was to determine just how closely the results of anti-mortem bacterial culture and susceptibility testing correlated with the clinical outcome after treatment uh, of feedlot cattle. In other words, what we were trying to determine was how well did the test or, uh, uh, give us a, a predictive clinical outcome, or another way of saying it is we wanted to test the test. So we procured 1,031 animals. These were, anim these were heifers, and they were perceived to likely be telathromycin resistant. Telathromycin, for those of you who may not recognize it, is uh, the brand name for that is Draxin. These, these animals were procured and, and brought to a research feedlot in Texas in the United States. Within 36 hours of arrival, these animals were processed using normal arrival protocols. Uh, and then a deep nasal pharyngeal swab was utilized to collect a sample for bacterial culture and susceptibility testing. Two ear notch samples were also taken uh, and sent to two separate laboratories to determine whether these animals uh, might be BVD persistently infected. If they were, they were removed from the study. In this case, five heifers were removed from the study. All animals were then given a metaphylactic dose of telathromycin per label because these animals were deemed to be at high risk of getting bovine respiratory disease. After a seven-day treatment moratorium, these animals were eligible to be, to be they were viewed and if they were uh, deemed to be potentially sick, they were eligible to be pulled from the pen and assessed to see whether or not they might have bovine respiratory disease. They were given a clinical, clinical attitude score of between zero and four. Zero is a normal looking animal, four is a moribund animal. If they had a clinical attitude score of one, but also had a rectal temperature of 39.7 or greater, then they were deemed to be, to have respiratory disease and they were then eligible to receive the treatment that I'll, that I'll tell you about shortly. As well, if they had a clinical attitude score of two or greater, again, they were deemed to have bovine respiratory disease. At that point, those animals that were eligible uh, uh, received another deep nasal pharyngeal swab to, to uh, collect a sample for bacterial culture and sensitivity. And a, they also had a nasal swab uh, that would be sent out for viral PCR testing. Animals were then retreated with telathromycin per the label dose. Now, some of you might ask, is that normal? The answer is no, but we wanted to, we wanted to use a second dose of telathromycin to keep the variables as uh, limited in this study. The deep nasal pharyngeal swabs were then sent out to a contract research facility and uh, they cultured for identifying Mannheimia hemolytica, Pasteurella multocida, Histophilus somni, and Mycoplasma bovis. For those isolates that were 
Benheimia hemolytica or Pastorella multocida. They were subjected to susceptibility testing and were then classified as either susceptible, intermediately susceptible, or resistant to telathromycin using standard microdilution techniques and what we call CLSI definitions. These data were then summarized. They were put into contingency tables and analyzed for both sensitivity and specificity, as well as their positive predictive value and their negative predictive value. The clinical outcome was assessed as follows. Treatment successes were those animals that were treated and then never needed, needed to be retreated. Treatment failure was those, were those animals that uh, had a deep nasal pharyngeal swab, but then never needed to receive another treatment. Let me show you the timeline here in this schematic. Essentially at day zero, again on arrival, these animals had a deep nasal pharyngeal swab. They were uh, BVD PI tested. Uh, they were then, they received their normal processing and they were treated with telathromycin. After a seven day post metaphylactic interval, they were, they were visualized on a daily basis and if they were deemed to be potentially sick, they were pulled from the pen and assessed for sickness. If they were, if they were sick at that point, they were a treatment failure from the first metaphylaxis that was given. And then they were given another deep nasal pharyngeal swab. They were swabbed, uh, uh, the, the nares was swabbed for viral PCR testing. And then they received the second dose of telathromycin. Again, they had a seven day post-treatment interval in which nothing was done. Starting on day eight, again, they, they were assessed on a daily basis and the study was completed after day 42 post-arrival. The number of animals totally that were received were 1,031. Five animals, again, were BVD PI positive and were removed from the study. 399 of these uh, total animals needed to be pulled and received their first treatment after their seven-day post-metaphylactic interval, which amounted to a 38.7% morbidity or first treatment pull rate, as we sometimes say in the U.S. This is the distribution of the telathromycin MICs. What you'll note is the P. multacida uh, is in orange, and you can see most of the P. multacida isolates were in fact very susceptible to telathromycin, whereas the Mannheimia hemolytica isolates were, were fairly bimodal. Many were susceptible, but also many were resistant. This is the statistical analysis for all of these telathromycin susceptibility tests. And which is, uh, what I can say is that the prevalence of uh, both susceptible and resistant isolates was sufficient to provide us a pretty good analysis of this data. The positive and the negative predictive values for both susceptible, which are on the bottom, Mannheimia hemolytica, these are the resistant, uh, isolates, Mannheimia hemolytica, Pastorella multocida. These were the susceptible isolates, Mannheimia hemolytica and Pastorella multocida. The, both the positive and the negative predictive values, as you see here, were pretty much averaged around 50%, which indicates a very poor correlation between the test result and the clinical outcome. Most of the animals with uh, telathromycin susceptible Pastorella multocida isolates uh, were treatment successes, and this is uh, indicated by the high sensitivity of 87% seen here. However, there were still animals uh, with Pastorella multocida isolates that were deemed to be susceptible, but these animals still were treatment failures. So this indicates a low specificity for the test of 21%. The sensitivity and the specificity of the, the susceptibility test for Mannheimia hemolytica isolates was really quite poor. As you can see here, for those isolates that were resistant, and as you can see here, for those isolates that were sensitive. So we might ask ourselves the question, why was there such poor correlation between the results of the antimicrobial susceptibility test and clinical outcome? So there are many reasons for this lack of correlation. 
First might be that the, even though deep nasopharyngeal swabs are a well-described technique and are thought to be a, a, a good way of getting antemortem samples, perhaps the, the swab was taking a sample from a part of the respiratory tract that was not representative of the infection. A second possible reason for this lack of correlation, as we all know, is when, when uh, we have a bacterial culture on a plate, there may, it, it may look to be all the same organisms uh, when, we're, when we're choosing colonies, but since only one colony was taken, that colony might be the, might be the correct, uh, the same genus and species of the other colonies, but that colony might not be the bacterium that's actually causing the disease. So we might be choosing as an example, a, a Mannheimia hemolytica that is not representative of the Mannheimia hemolytica that is deep in the lungs. We also all know that antibiotics are not silver bullets. They require the animal's own immune system to help clear the infection. And perhaps some of these animals were so severely immunocompromised that they were not able to respond uh, even though they had a good antimicrobial uh, uh, on board. Another possible reason for lack of correlation is the uh, recognized um, characteristic of telathromycin, at least as recognized in Europe, that telathromycin has uh, immune stimulating effects and anti-inflammatory effects besides being an antimicrobial. So that might explain why, even though we had, uh, we had uh, a an organism that was resistant, nevertheless, the animal was able to clear the infection. And finally, and I think this is particularly important for uh, many of us veterinarians who have been around for a while, is that bovine respiratory disease is a disease complex. It's multifactorial and often involves multiple pathogens. To illustrate this, let's look at the, at the relative risk of uh, treatment failure when animals were PCR positive for one of the four common viruses. There was a statistically significant increased risk for treatment failure associated with these positive viral PCRs. Uh, and this is imp particularly noted for those animals that were PCR positive either for IBR or BVD, highly likely to have a treatment failure. This is a histogram that perhaps vis uh, describes this uh, in a more visual way. So in blue, you can see for those animals uh, that, had, that were PCR positive for the four common viruses, if, if they were positive for PI3, they had a 61% likelihood of a treatment failure. If they were positive uh, for bovine herpes virus 1, a 70% uh, likelihood of treatment failure. And that's in comparison in the or to the orange bars where the virus was not present based upon PCR. So uh, looking at, at this table, essentially what it shows from, from left to right is that the more pathogens that were present uh, based upon PCR and bacterial cultures and, and uh, mycoplasma uh, cultures, the more likely these animals were not to cure. So tur uh, turning that around yet another way, the fewer the number of pathogens that were present, the more likely the animals were to respond to treatment. Sorry, let me, let me just go back because I, this is my reading Japanese here. Sorry about that, I, not bad. Okay, let me just show you, the, let me just show you the, uh, this table. This, this is a table showing the number of pathogens present for, uh, for each animal. So on the left, these animals, 20 of them, even though they were, they were deemed to have bovine respiratory disease, we found no pathogens. By contrast, these animals here had two, three, four, five, and even more pathogens present. So they were much more likely to be treatment failures. So the, finally, the question comes in, how do we, how do we choose an an antibiotic to use when we're confronted with bovine respiratory disease? Well, many of us as, as clinicians, we start with our experience, certainly, uh, or we look at case control studies. Um, you know, we do diagnostic testing and clinical signs, and I would, cons I would suggest that that's sort of a base of a decision pyramid. But probably the very best ways to decide are looking at randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, and in particular, meta-analyses.
because that's probably the best way for us to determine the likely efficacy of an antimicrobial agent. I want to thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions.